Now the story is going to be different. The personalities of the characters are going to be unique, but you know that mm -hmm. it's going to end with a happy, happy ever after. It's going to have some thread of quilting, quilters okay. or quilts in it. It's going to have some side story of a family facing Alzheimer's disease. You're going to pick up a book and you know you're going to find those things. Welcome back to the podcast today. I am joined by Ashley Montgomery. Um, Ashley is a writer and also runs a nonprofit and talks about quite a different, a lot of different interests of hers through her um her uh, socials and websites and all the things. And so I have asked Ashley to be on the podcast today to one, talk about her experience of publishing and um, writing novels and all that, but also to, to talk about this idea of when you have lots of interests, how do you kind of incorporate them and, um, and relay that to readers and, and kind of weave it all together. So it makes sense. And so I'm so excited for you to be here today, Ashley. Thank you for joining me. Well, I'm very excited to be here and I could talk this stuff for hours and hours and hours. So um, I know we're going to have a lot of fun and I just I appreciate the opportunity to share the journey that I've been on, whether that's as a writer, as a quilter, as an advocate for Alzheimer's disease, all these different hats I wear. Um, I, I'm always looking for ways to share those with people. And, and this is an awesome opportunity. So I, I thank you for letting me be here. I I love it. I can't wait to get into this conversation. So let's let's just get right to it. Why don't we? So you have how many books now do you have? Um, have you I released have three released? I have one coming out at the first of April. Okay. And I have a short story that I use as a lead magnet. That's a freebie out there and it will turn into a full novel in time. Okay. Uh, it's kind of the introduction to one. And then I have a free short story memoir of my pen name. That's okay. Out. Solid novels. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Three sol solid novels. Um, so what intrigued me when I first learned about you and sorry, like, Okay, let me research Ashley. Who is she? Is she somebody I want to invite onto the podcast? What intrigued me is that you you have like woven all these different interests under a pen name. Yes. And I I just kind of was intrigued by this whole quilting novels, advocating for um, you know, um advocating for awareness around all Alzheimer's and all this other these other hats that you wear. And I just thought it was interesting. You had woven them all together in this um, beautiful way. And it, your website is gorgeous, by the way. I just loved it when I came upon it. Um, but can you just share a little bit how you got to that point of, you know, just how you got to this point of where all these different interests are together and also how you came up with your pen name? Yeah, so I, I love doing lots of different things. Uh, way, way, way back in high school, I think I was voted most representative, which I say is the Busybody Award, because <laughs> I was representing all these different groups and activities and organizations, and I feel like that's just been me my whole life. I, mm -hmm. I enjoy doing a lot of different things. Uh, some people would tell you that means I don't do any of them at the highest level that I could. But if someone says, what hat are you willing to throw away? I, I really struggle with that because I get a lot of joy out of all the different activities in my life. And I noticed that I was often referred to as Coach Monty's wife or Canon and Macy's mom or the mm. PTA president. Like I, you have all these different roles and they each have different titles mm -hmm. in, in the world. And when I added being an author to the roles in my life, I wanted it to have a name. I wanted mm. it to be something that could stand by itself and wasn't reliant on all the other hats that I wear. And the, the thing that really enticed me to write stories, I had these, these plots and these scenes and dialogue that lived in my head and I would lay in bed at night and I would envision these scenes and, and they kind of haunted me. I, could, I couldn't get away from them. So I decided to write them down and I thought a lot about what I love in books. Mm. And it's not just the written words. It's not just the dialogue. It's not just the character interactions. But I started thinking that my three grandmothers 
gave me life lessons in all three of those areas. Okay. My, my mom's mom was an avid reader. She was surrounded by books, really taught me to love books. My dad's mom was a writer. I have hundreds of cards handwritten she would send for no reason I have all the Christmas and the Easter and and all the Valentine's and Halloween all of those kinds of cards mm. but just a random note in the mail and I learned how important it was to share your words with with your loved ones through writing and then my bonus grandmother my stepdad's mom she was a visitor and she had a huge island in her kitchen. She was a professional seamstress. And so she, this island was her work table. Mm. But any hour of the day, random people, family, friends, community members, just revolving front door. And they would come in and out, get a cup of coffee. She always had homemade cookies in the jar. And, and I just would spend all of my my free time in, in her kitchen listening to people visit while she worked. Mm -hmm. And I just learned so many valuable lessons about community from her. And I think that I need all three of those elements to make my books, not only engaging, but a true reflection of who I am. And mm -hmm. I wanted to honor the three of them. So I took bits and pieces of their names. Um, my, my grandmother on my, my mom's mom, the first one I spoke of was Sybil, Virginia. So I took the Virginia from her, my dad's mom, who I spoke about second, her name is Adele and that's my middle name. So I took Virginia and Adele and I smushed them together to make Virginia Dale. And mm -hmm. then my bonus grandmother, her maiden name was Smith and mm -hmm. I tagged that on. So my three grandmothers together made my pen name. That's, that's such a beautiful, I love that story. That's such a such a beautiful like tribute to these women who were such an influence in your life. It's such a um it's so thoughtful and like um just really intentional with the way that you went about first of all deciding to have a pen name and then also how you picked your pen name is just so beautiful. It's such a such a beautiful way to go about doing something like that. And so um did you did you immediately start with the pen name or was that something that you pulled in as you're going about? No, I, I did and a little selfishly. Um, those three were probably my biggest fans. I could do no wrong in their eyes. Yeah. And so seeing their names and I actually, I had a coloring page that I, ways, ways to decompress. Right. Uh -huh. And I, colored their names and it was sitting by my computer when I would type mm -hmm. and write and, and try and come up with these stories and, and the story arc specifically. Uh, my background is not in English or uh, literature. I'm a math major. I used to be a math Oh, teacher. wow. Okay. And so I really had to learn how to create a good story arc and what that looks mm -hmm. like. The, the five milestones of a really good story. Mm -hmm. And so I would see that that coloring page and I would get a lot of encouragement because I knew that if the three of them were still here with us on earth, they would be my biggest cheerleaders. And yeah. if no one else loved my story, they were going to tell me it was amazing. And that that's really a good push to keep going mm -hmm. at times when you can't come up with anything or a scene just kind of stinks and you're like, I, I wouldn't read this. Why would anyone else? <laughs> just to have that little bit of encouragement yeah, to keep yeah. going and in those I, moments. From from day one, I knew that I wanted to use that pen name and it was really special to me. I knew that it was going to be important to, to kind of keep all these different slices of my life um, a little compartmentalized, be, mm -hmm. be able to to put this hat on and then also be able to take it off when I needed mm -hmm. to. So I, I was intentional from the beginning with the pen name. Yeah. And did you, did it, does it cause any trouble with marketing to have the pen name? It, you... it, can, it can be tricky. So I, I'm an independent author, um, but even the traditionally published authors are expected to have a big social audience these days. And I think that using my own sphere of influence was challenging in the beginning because they knew I was writing books, but they they weren't that they weren't connecting Virginia Dale Smith with Ashley Montgomery. Mm. And so I, I very purposefully created uh, handles. My my Instagram handle is Ashley M Virginia Dale Smith. Uh, my 
my Facebook, my, my personal page is mine is Ashley, but then my author page is author Virginia Dale Smith. Mm. And I connect those two. They have the same avatar photo so that if people are trying to look for me, they recognize me on both yeah. of them. They see the connection between, mm -hmm. between the brand elements. That's interesting. Yeah. I would find, I would think that that would be a little bit more tricky to communicate to those who already know you yes. or who have, um, gotten to know you as Ashley to then like translate that over to that for them. Like, Hey, you need to come support me over here. I know, I know. I think people can be really successful with it. And I say that because some of the most successful indie authors that I've met and collaborated with and learned from over these last two years have recently started a new pen name for a new genre. Mm. So here they've worked so hard to build this brand and to make this name recognizable. And they're willing to go out and go through those steps with another name. So that tells me that it can be a very successful path. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So you came up with this pen name and you set out to kind of create your author world <laughs> mm -hmm. and you did with the um, pairing together of like the quilting and the recipes and the novels, was that an easy thing that came right away? Or was that something that you figured out over time? I mentioned that I, I my writing is not my background. And mm -hmm. so I, I had to write what I know because I don't know how to write something else. And it was very natural yeah. to write in my love of food and cooking and baking and to give some of those traits to my characters because it was a way that I could enrich their personalities on things that I was knowledgeable about. Same thing with the quilting. But at the end of the day, all of those pieces that I put of myself into the books, they create a unique product. And mm -hmm. I, I think that, oh goodness, when I started writing two and a half years ago, someone gave me the statistic that there are a thousand books published a day on Amazon. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not going to market to every single reader. And I mm -mm. love that our world is all about reading. I, I mm -hmm. feel like with technology, it would be easy for the pace of life to move beyond the, the stillness that it takes to sit down and enjoy a book. So and true. so mm -hmm. I'm so happy that books are as popular as they are, but I, I need a way to really hone in on a specific niche mm -hmm. so that I can find a small set. And when I say small, I would love for it to be about 10,000 people. That's mm -hmm. my goal that truly love what I write. Mm -hmm. They may not be quilters, but they love reading about quilts. Yeah. They may not be bakers, but they love reading about a bakery. They mm -hmm. may not have Alzheimer's in their family, but they have a heart for those going through it. Right. right. And so I, I was instructed or, or coached at one point by a publishing coach to pick five to seven elements that are going to be in every one of my books. And mm. that becomes my brand. And okay. so I sat down and I said, these are seven, I think I have seven or eight things that you're going to pick up a book and you know, you're going to find those things. Now the story is going to be different. The personalities of the characters are going to be unique. Every story is going to make you uh, experience a little different journey with, mm -hmm. with the, the, the characters, but you know that you're, it's going to have a lovely tone to it. It's going to have kind people in it. Mm. It's going to end with a happy, happy ever after. It's going to have some thread of quilting quilters okay. or quilts in it. It's going to have some side story of a family facing Alzheimer's disease um, it, you you kind of know what you're going to get. It's going to be somewhere between 65 and 75,000 words. It's going to be around 36 chapters. Like I, I, I'm trying to be really consistent with specific brand elements because I want, I don't want people to think, oh, well, it's, you know, I know what I'm going to get. There's no reason to read that book, but I do want them to say, I know what I'm going to get. I want to read that book. It's going to yeah, be. Yeah. I, that, that is so good. It's such good advice. And I love how you're approaching that, like picking out those elements and saying this will be a part of this branding, because that's really what branding is, right? It's saying these are the values of my company. 
this is what we're the kind of product that we're going to produce time yeah. after time after time. And and this is what people are going to see and they're going to get used to seeing that. And um, I, I will say my books have a lot of sizzle, but they have no sex. So if someone is, is not comfortable reading more explicit romance, they know right off the bat, you read one of my books and, and you see the heat level and you know, mm. it's going to be an emotional roller coaster, but you're not going to go behind closed doors with the characters. Right. And I think that there's some safety in that, especially in faith-based literature. I think that it's nice to be able to say maybe to a young adult reader, um, here's a series that that I know I can recommend mm -hmm. because it's going to be engaging. It's going to have, you know, all the sizzle, but I'm not accidentally giving a book to someone that is more than what they want to pick up and read. And I think yeah. that's important to know where those boundaries are. That brings up a really good point because, and I wonder if we can maybe kind of go a little bit more with this because yeah. there has been this kind of, um, I, I don't want to call it a trend because that's not really what it is, but you write in the romantic genre, like the, what, what specifically would you say the genre is that you write in? I call it, um, wholesome and heartfelt romance. Okay. So I've heard that term. I've heard sweet romance. I've heard clean romance. I've heard like all these different things. Does your book, would you consider it Christian or is it? I, I do. And, and okay. it's because um, not all of my characters ha have been saved and there there's not a, a call to salvation, mm -hmm. but there is a heavy element of Christian faith. And the key characters that are present in my community that I created. So all my books are set in or around one community. It's called okay. Green Hills. And it's a fictional town. I completely dreamed it up. But there are some staples to the community. Mm. And those people share their faith through their actions. And okay. I feel like for me, part of my brand, um, there will always be examples of 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 people living their faith. Hmm. I'm not confident enough in my Bible knowledge to preach to somebody. I'm not confident enough to tell them this is what you need to know, but I do try to live my life so that if someone says, where does her peace come from? Where does her contentment come from? Where's her joy come from? Someone else may say, oh, it's because she's a Christian. Hmm. And hmm. so my characters, oftentimes um, they they find faith or they rely on faith when, when they didn't realize they, they needed to, or they didn't realize it was part of their DNA. And then when they're challenged, that's where they turn. And, and so I do think that my books are Christian fiction. Uh, like I said, not all of my characters have been saved. And I've had a couple of people on both ends of the spectrum. I've, I've received some really valuable feedback that say, there was a four letter word in the book. I can't read your books anymore. And mm -hmm. I get that. I understand. But I also know that there are people in, that come in and out of our lives that don't have the same religious background we do. And that by living my faith, I might be able to bring them towards a more mm -hmm. Christian based life. Well, and I think you're probably just more, um, accurately representing what a town would actually be like yes. you're not going to find a town fully of full of christian people like that's that's right. not really a town that's a you know a commune sure. Sure. Well, <laughs> you know what I mean? I've, had, I've had just the opposite though i've had emails where people say i love your storyline but it's just too preachy for me i don't want mm. their scripture in my romance novels i open every chapter with a quote okay and I use scripture in a lot of those quotes. Uh -huh. My last book, I, I wasn't exactly sure where the element of faith was going to come into that. And it ended up being my most religious book because as I started writing it, I realized that the challenge that the, the main character Mackenzie faces, she's not going to get through that without faith. Mm. And the people around her provided that, that avenue and, and that's, that was what she needed. And so I had some people say, 
I, I'm not, I'm not a Christian or I, I don't, I don't enjoy reading th this much religion. And so I've had both ends of the spectrum. Which is so okay. interesting because like, I think this kind of goes into um, the question of like, what exactly is Christian fiction? Like, I think we kind of got it into our, even as you were, I asked you the question, like, is, would you consider your book Christian? And you're like, well, it doesn't have a salvation or a conversion story. Right. And I'm like, where, at what point did we start associating that in order for something to be a Christian novel, it had to have some kind of conversion take place. Why can't we just have our characters living out their faith and that be the story? And um, I just, it's something I think that we in the, in the publishing world as Christians who are putting this work out there, you know, we're writing from our worldview mm -hmm. and our worldview has to inform what we do. And we have to be true this, to the story and to who, who our reader is and keeping those three things in mind. That's what's going to inform where on that spectrum of how overtly it mentions God or not. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to stop quantifying something as Christian based off of if it has a conversion story or not, or if it talks about all God all the time or not, or if it, whatever, whatever it might be, what I think we need to start really having honest conversations with ourselves is we need to be making fiction that meets the reader where they're at is true to our worldview. And it's yeah. true to the story we're trying to tell. And that is the point of what we do to the God's glory, right? Not right. trying to find a certain formula that we need to be in, but it does beg the question, like how do we navigate when readers pick up our books and then they get mad at us because it has a swear word in it or a reader picks up a book and they get mad because it's scripture in it. And you're like, what do I do? Well, and I, to me, it comes back to those 10,000 people that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And those, that those three or five or eight people are probably not going to be part of my 10,000. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I appreciate that they, uh, that they picked up my book, something, uh, you know, was appealing to them and they read it. And then they took the time to give me feedback. And it was funny because one of my best, uh, I guess, reviews that I have on my website was a woman who emailed me and said, um, I absolutely love your writing. Your characters are engaging. Um, their emotional journey is, is true to life. I felt their pain. I cried with them. I laughed with them. I was so happy. Like she went through all these amazing things and she said, but I have to tell you, um, I, I can't. I can't read any more of your books and blah, blah, blah. And I emailed her back and I told her how much I appreciated her email mm -hmm. and that it was really good for me to hear what, what people of, of faith are finding in the books. And then I said, do you mind if I use that first paragraph? Because what you wrote is beautiful. And that that's exactly what I'm going for in mm -hmm. my character development. And she said, yeah, you can use any part of my email. I'm just not going to be part of your audience. And Interesting. I love her honesty. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love the fact that you went back to her and said, okay, you, you, you're not going to read my books anymore, but can I use your review? <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Well, and to me, it was really encouraging because my book is not going to be for every single person and every book on Amazon is not for me. <laughs> so true. As a reader. And that's so okay. True. That so is true. okay. You know, and I'll be honest, like I don't typically pick up like the sweet romance, wholesome romance books, just not typically what I pick up, but that doesn't mean it's not a good book and it's right. not engaging and it's not satisfying that yeah. experience for somebody else. And I love the fact that she honed in on, I laughed with them. I cried with them because I think so much we get caught up in our heads as writers about plot or genre or whatever, that we forget we're creating an experience for our reader. We're not writing a romantic novel we're writing a novel that allows the reader to experience romance and yeah. like that's different you know it's not it takes it from the headspace to the heart space and it's so important as writers that we get that not only in the crafting of our novels but then in the marketing of them as well sure. because if we don't know the experience we're giving the reader we can't tell them that that's what they're going to get yeah no i i agree completely and a lot of times I refer to my books as love stories and not novels mm. because I want to share a story 
Yeah. And uh, the storytelling is more important than the formatting or the novel or, or yeah. something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. So true. Okay. I'm about to nerd out on you a little bit here. So <laughs> you mentioned this 10,000 number, which I love that you are so like focused. You have a goal, you know, exactly the niche you're in. You're like, these are my interests and I'm writing for people who have sim- similar interests. And you're like, this is what I'm about. And yeah. I know before we hit record, we were talking about how this isn't necessarily your full-time gig. This is something that you're doing um, as a passion project is what you said, that you, you see your husband working and providing that's kind of income for the family, mm-hmm. that this kind of goes above and beyond that, yeah. that this is a passion project is something that you have. Um, but you do have goals. It sounds like with oh, yeah. what kind of audience and platform you want to grow um so the, my question to you is how did you decide to go the indie route and um and are you are you happy with that decision or do you like tell us a little bit more about that the indie route just felt like the perfect fit for me <laughs> i knew that i didn't want to spend possibly years shopping a story i wanted to write it I wanted to share it with whoever wanted to read it mm-hmm. and then I wanted to move on with my life. And mm-hmm. part of my Achilles heel of wearing all these hats and loving all these things is that I get really into something and then it kind of burns itself out. And then I go to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And if I tried to spend 10 years per book, like some of the really amazing authors do, mm-hmm. I would be bored and, and done long before I ever got it published. Yeah. And so it just felt right. And I'm a little bit of a control freak. I'm a type A personality and I wanted to be able to choose my cover art and I wanted to decide on the final edits. Publishing is as easy as it's ever been. Yeah, that's true. It, it, and and updating your manuscript is as easy as it's ever been. I think as you're talking about that waiting process and you're talking about kind of needing to move on to a new project after so long. Um, I think that is a drawback of traditional publishing that kind of dragged out process. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's kind of hard to keep the momentum going on that one project when it is drawn out like that. But also um, what I thought was interesting is as you're talking about it, I'm like, you're not really changing. You're not moving away from the thing that you're doing. You're moving on to the next product that will serve your reader. You know, so it's like, you're not saying like, oh, I'm moving on from being a writer to now being, you know, a baker or something like that. That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about like, here's a product. I've offered it to my readers. Now I need to go make another product to offer to my readers and so on and so forth. And so I think it's important to note that just because I think, I think probably more writers are like you than are not. Like, I think we have all these ideas And we get the one down and we do want to move on to the next one because we love the creative process. Like it's just such a part of us. So for me, it is about this product is finished. This book is done. Is it perfect? Probably not. Is it a ton of fun? Yes. And then let's go get to know the next set of characters and just keep going through that process. I actually had someone, um, I guess there's an, an Amazon review on my last book and it says something like if a if a publishing house doesn't pick her up soon, it's a crime. And it caused another reader to email me and say, hey, this got me thinking if if a big publishing house comes, are you going to do that? Are you like, are you, are you yeah. going to give away your control? And it, it it's it's a great question. It's a million dollar question. I don't have any I don't have any answers. That's- there are times it would be nice to hand over some of the tasks because as an indie author it is overseeing the blurb and the cover design and the story arc and the development and the character growth and the editing and the proofreading and the interviewing and and auditioning narrators and I mean it's a lot I'm not gonna lie it's so much more than what I realized but do you need a publisher or do you just need a product manager Probably. Do those exist? Yeah. Will you send them to me? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you can find people. They Because here's the thing that people don't quite realize is that 
a publisher literally has all the things you're talking about. They have somebody who's worried about the production, somebody who's worried about the product and the marketing, somebody who's worried about marketing and public relations. Then you have the editors, you have the cover designers, like the design people, right? Those are all people that there are people out there that freelance that stuff. Sure. There's virtual assistants who do those tasks. Like there are people out there you can hire on your team and you become more of just that publishing hat. The one thing publishers don't have are the people who create the products. Right. Right. And that's the writer. Right. And so as writers, what we can do is say, okay, I, if we're going to go the indie route, if we're going to self publish, we're saying, all right, I can either do all the hats myself, which is what you're doing right now and what a lot of indie writers do. But then at some point I can shift some of that off of myself and hire on people and function like a publisher does where they hire people into their staff to oversee the product development. You just would be hiring freelancers. And I think I'm ready. I think book four comes out at the first of April, um, April 2nd. And I think going into my next mini series, my books five, six, and seven, I think I'm ready for that. But I'm really glad that I did it myself here in the beginning. I think mm-hmm. it's valuable for me to understand the process and how it works and what goes into it. Right. Now I can have educated conversations with those freelancers and exactly. truly build a publishing team. Yeah. I think I think you're right. I think that I'm I'm to that point. I don't know that I've that I was before book four, but I think I'm there now. Right. And that's a you know that's a good question is to ask yourself is what's the one thing I really hate doing? And start with that, right? right? And I bring that up just because you had said about getting picked up by a big publisher. And it's true. Like if you got picked up by like a big, big publisher, they might be able to offer you a really good advance. But an advance is just pre-sales on a ro- royalties, right? So you have to kind of like weigh out. Like your goal is these 10,000 niched readers, Right. And this is why we always have to go back to this conversation. Like this is why you can't say like, oh, self-publishing is so much better than traditional publishing or traditional publishing is the way to go. Like at the end of the day, it really has to be about your you as an author. What are your business decisions? What are your business goals? Who are you serving? What are the type of stories you tell and what model of publishing works best for you and what you're trying to do? And then how can you grow it after that? I don't think that there's a a magic answer because uh, like we were saying earlier, I think that the big publishing houses are expecting their authors to do an enormous amount of their social marketing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whether it's, it's working with, with social media or it's um, marketing your, your own things. Like I, I think even the, the big name authors, that, that everyone hears of or that you see on, on the shelf at Barnes and Noble or at Target or Walmart, I think that they are still having to hire that assistant to help them keep up with the things that they're being asked to do. Oh, for sure. 100%. So I want to pivot a little bit here okay. into like the nitty gritty. I told you, I warned you. I'm like, I'm going to nerd out on you. Right. So we're kind of, we're kind of in that space right now, but, um, you have this targeted number of 10,000. How close are you to that? Do you think? Oh, um, I my newsletter um, distribution list is right around 5,000. Okay. But I wouldn't say that those are 5,000 dedicated readers. Okay. I would say maybe half of that, maybe 2,500. When, when I send something out to my, like when I send this new release out in April, um, I think, I think maybe 2000 to 2500 of those people are going to say, I want this book. I'm going to okay. get it. Which, okay. Let's just put it out there for people that might not know most, but bo- like the majority of books, I think the last time I heard a number thrown out there was like over the lifetime of the book will earn like 3000 copies. They'll sell. Oh, really? That's yes. An interesting number. So the fact that you're hitting that 2,200, you know, 2,500 mark is pretty impressive, especially like since these books are not like their lifetime is not done yet, right? They can continue to keep selling. And the more you go out in the series, 
the more of book one and book two and book three you sell, right? Because people are like, oh, I want to start at the beginning. Um, and so that, that's just a really interesting thing. So what have you done? Because that's an 5,000 on an email list is nothing to sneeze at. So what have you done to get those those email subscribers? Like, what did you do? Yeah, tell, us your, so- tell us your secrets. <laughs> In the beginning... I just, I wouldn't take time to write a lead magnet. So I was doing a weekly newsletter and I will tell you that we, my family's been in the middle of a move from Oklahoma to Alabama and uh, my newsletter recipients have not heard from me in a couple of weeks um, because I try to be really consistent. Mm. Uh, my newsletter is pretty, it's personal, not, not like, you know, right. secrets, but I share my Alzheimer's work. I share my quilting projects. I share my, I I run a nonprofit business that um, uh, connects quilters with the fight to end Alzheimer's disease. I have my book business. Uh, We are this college football family. And so I'm always sharing game stuff. Um, My son played football for my husband and, and now coaches for him. And so Mm -hmm. I've shared his journey. My daughter is a cheerleader on the sidelines at our ball games and I've shared her journey and, So our family has been a big element and our just day-to-day lifestyle has been a big element of my newsletters, which I needed that because when you're just starting out, you can only talk about one book that's in production so often. Well, (laughs) and I think, I think you're right. Yeah, Yeah. you're right about that because, and I think that's where writers kind of get trapped up. They're like, what am I supposed to post about? What am I supposed to talk about? And they think it's, they have to talk about the book and it's like, well, no, really, Readers fall in love with the author, really, at the at the at least in our day and age, it might not have been that way a couple hundred years ago. But right. in our day and age, they want to know about you. They want to know your worldview. They want to know your life. They want to know that your storytelling ability. They want to know that they can trust to be engaged in an, an experience with you. Right. And in order to be in that experience with you, they have to trust you as an author. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's what you're saying. You're saying you had to share those things. And I'm sure people, you know, you're talking about it. And I'm like, oh, she's a really interesting person. I should get on her her newsletter. (laughs) Well, I think that whether you're an author, whether you're a football coach, whether you're a yoga instructor, whether you, you know, uh, are a a chef at a restaurant, you are a brand. In Mm -hmm. today's world, every person walking around is a brand. Right. And they're representing all those things that you just listed. Mm-hmm. And so for new authors that don't know what to post or don't know what to share in a newsletter, I say go back to those seven to nine brand elements mm-hmm. and share those. And if it's not your own content, if if I'm sharing Alzheimer's information, I go to the Alzheimer's Association. I serve on the board of directors here in Oklahoma. I know that their information is sound and I don't have to go do the research on the new drugs. I say, okay, audience, this is important to me. And I want you to know this is going on in the world. Mm. And so I definitely um, have had my attrition rate now that I have a lead magnet or they, you know, sign, sign up for this or that, get the newsletter and they fall off. I, every week I go through and archive unsubscribes and I'm okay with that because I'm looking for those 10,000 mm-hmm. and I'm, I don't want stragglers that aren't interested. I want 10,000 people that are going to be so excited about every project. If I'm sharing a new quilt, they're going to click on the link to go look at the pictures mm. or they're going to share it with their friends and say, I know this lady that quilts and I thought you might like to see the pattern that she's selling as an Alzheimer's fundraiser or people see it and and they they call a friend or they have a coworker and they say, hey, I know that your family's going through this and I want you to know that there are 350 Alzheimer's walks across the country and that might be a great thing for your family because this author that I follow does it and it's really motivational. Yeah. I want to connect with those 10,000 people. Yeah. And if I have those people who subscribe and then fall back off because they're not engaged or they don't want to connect, I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. And I, I do a lot of newsletter swaps. I try to find that balance at the bottom of every newsletter. I have a couple of specific swaps where other authors in my genre 
and and I try to be really consistent. I am not doing slasher. I'm not doing erotica. I'm not doing crime novels. Right. I want to make sure that my <laughs> ten thousand people want to read wholesome and heartfelt romance. So true. So true. And so I'm real specific about the other books that I share. Um, I go in before I sign up for a newsletter swap. I go check out that person's newsletter. I make sure it's done professionally. Mm -hmm. um, I make sure that that their books look like something my readers would be interested in clicking on. And then I do a couple of group promos. And uh, I do that every single week. And that has really helped. Uh, I do some of the newsletter builders through um, book sweeps. That's been a really successful one for me. Mm -hmm. I do authors XP. Um, I do... What are a couple of the others that I've done? I think I noticed that you have, you're on book funnel. Um, yes, I do. I have. Um, so my lead magnet is, is posted on book funnel. So when, when you see one of my promos and you click on it to download the free book, subscribe to the newsletter that goes through book funnel and, and all of these platforms are so user-friendly and they all connect to one another. Mm. So when someone goes to book funnel and clicks on my lead magnet, they automatically go into my, my mail channel. Audience. Right. And I think that taking the time as a new author to figure out those systems is important. When I started on November 3rd of 2021, I had 49 subscribers. And that was from, I already had a MailChimp account from my blog that I had been doing for about 10 years mm. and had I'd never done anything with it. It was just a place right. for me to rant or share or whatever. But I would say- I love the honesty. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that 20 of those 49 people were just my immediate family, my cousins, my sister, you know, my, my mm -hmm. best friend. And my goal was to have a thousand people by the end of the first year and I think I was at about 2000 oh, and then wow. my goal was to be at 5,000 within three years. And I, I'm almost there, which, you know, my, my goal would be November of this year to be, or of next year actually to be there. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it has, it has gone well and it's, it, it has built quickly. So it sounds like to me that you are just taking advantage of different platforms. You're taking advantage of collaborations with other authors in your genre through the, like the email swap and other things. And you're just putting yourself out there Yeah. and uh, you offered a lead magnet and um, all those things are working in your favor to build that list. So that's really good. So as we start to kind of wrap things up a little bit, I wanted to ask you if there was any tool that you think that a fiction writer absolutely must have. So the tools that I really rely on, um, I write in Scrivener mm -hmm. and um, for me, uh, I really like the way that it, that it organizes things. And I, I also use pro writing aid and the two of them connect. So yes. I can open up my file in Scrivener and I can write in the way that I like to write and then my first round of editing is to open up that same file in Pro Writing Aid and to read it out loud to myself. I think that those two writing platforms together make me a better writer. And mm -hmm. I did not use them in my first book. I used them a little bit in my second book. And I really figured out how they function in my third book. And without a doubt, my third book is my best quality mm -hmm. of writing. Interesting. All right. Last, last question for you. What piece of advice would you give a writer who's just starting out on this publishing journey? So this is probably not going to be very popular with publishing coaches, but I wish that I had written all four of these stories before I started publishing. And mm -hmm. I was so eager, just get that first book out there and start selling it and start sharing it. And then that starts in motion, a hamster wheel that mm. I've had a hard time slowing down. And I feel like I'm always behind. And as an indie author, your deadlines are self-inflicted, but they're real. Yeah. 
maybe you don't have to write four books in a series, but I would say at least have your first two books ready so, to go before you release the first one. So what I'm hearing you say is that to have a plan for what's coming down the pipeline so yeah. that you are a little ahead of the game and not being reactive. You're more in that proactive space. Absolutely. And and I'm not saying that you have to, to do a rapid release where you say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to do book one and 30 days later, I'm doing book two and 30 days after that book three. If you have them all written, that's great. I'm saying have the first book, everything. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in my world, I have a set of 12 items that I want to have for every book. Mm -hmm. I want to have the ebook. I want to have the autographed hardcovers. The autographed hardcover comes with a postcard. It comes with a recipe. It comes with a sticker, comes with a bookmark. I also want to have a quilt pattern for that. I want to have the audio book. I do a piece of merchandise for every book, like just a way to connect with Green Hills. I have all of these things that I want to do for every release. And I'm still trying to get some of those done for book one. Right. Which like you almost need a production person for just your novel and then a production person for your merchandise. Yes. Yes. But I, to me, that's all part of the brand. And I think in hindsight that if I had written and edited and had the audiobook done, had right. the copies done, had everything finished before the first one was published, I think it would have been a smoother ride. Hmm. I love that. And I thank you so much, Ashley, for coming and joining us today. I think it has been such a great conversation. I I mean, I hope you've enjoyed it because I've enjoyed it. And I think I think our listeners are going to enjoy it, too, and learn a lot from it as well. Um, just the different gold nuggets you had along the way and just sharing your experience with us was really enjoyable to hear about. Well, thank you for having me. I, I, I've i got some notes. I'm going to go follow up on some things. <laughs> awesome. And thank you for listening to today's episode. Join us next week as we continue the conversation of the business of Christian fiction. Bye.